Guys, this flippin' book is awesome. It's awesome. And I am only five chapters into it, but I am getting the same sort of excitement that I got early in Memories of Ice. I got that again, you know, I, I got that through House of Chains as well. And I got that through Midnight Tides. And then obviously, obviously the first half of Bone Hunters just knocked my socks off. Uh, I went through a little bit of a dip because I was just kind of blasting through it and I wasn't really soaking in all that awesome meaning and things uh, and, and some of the details that I really should have been. But I've been going slow with this one and I am getting all the same sort of vibes that I was getting. So if you will indulge me, I am going to go through this scene by scene. For this one, I'm doing it sort of Memories of Ice style. Uh, and if you don't want to listen to it, that's that's fine. Maybe I'll do some sort of sub book one thing or 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 halfway mark thing. You know, I'll do some, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do some silly stuff as well. But this chapter was amazing and he's becoming a better writer i feel as we as we go forward now i i'll say it again uh because i don't know which video i did this on i feel like uh reaper's gale is a great like spiritual successor to memories of ice in some ways in terms of the themes that are really driven home I feel like Memories of Ice so beautifully led into Midnight Tides and then obviously Midnight Tides leads into this one. And I think this is my favorite. Uh, if I was going to reread it, the whole series so far, but maybe not read the whole thing, I might read... Uh, well, you got to read all of them. But I love... I, I'm just loving this one. I'm loving this one. I was going to say that you would read memories of ice and midnight tides and then this one but that's that's just silly you got to read all of them anyway let me go through chapter five because it is incredible and i'm so excited to go through it this second time uh because i will see things probably that i didn't see the first time now let's start with this chapter five epigraph because it is amazing and it kind of brings up a lot of things that we will see in this chapter, especially with a couple of these characters. I'm not going to read it all, but it goes, it, it kind of starts with this idea of, of denigration of vaunted ideals, almost in this way that's kind of like this toad in water sort of thing where they can't really point to a certain event that occurred. Uh, but more just a series of little degradations of of words, of language, of certain ways of, of, of interpreting things or doing things, lies going unchallenged, truth being lost, a chimera reshaped to match agenda, prejudice, prejudices, thus consigning the entire population or the entire political process to a mummer's charade of false indignation man i mean you can really look at that in in our state of politics but uh hypocritical posturing and a pervasive contempt for the commonry so it's almost like it's slowly changing corruption is kind of by degrees until once subsumed ideals and the honor created by their avowal can never rega uh, be regained, except, alas, by outright unconstrained rejection. So it's like this, it's slowly trickling to this, this moment until there is this flashpoint of revolution. And that got me so excited because since, since Midnight Tides, I was just obsessed with this dynamic between Lethary and Edur. And I did not I did not really follow the 
the hints that I bet are there in Midnight Tides that it won't necessarily be one side swept away, but kind of like this commingling of both sides where really uh, it, it's this it's it's this mixture. It's this two headed bug, this two headed spider sort of thing. It's it's brown eye and blue eye. It is these people who who have these different things working within them. It is this uh, this emperor e doer who used to have the skin, this gray skin. Now he has these coins. He has uh, lots working within them. It is like these these uh, dragons, or, or what are they called? Not the soul taken. Yeah, the bone casters are the are the Talani mass. Uh, it's like these soul taken who have things working within them. It is like this uh, Janeth, is that her name? Working on tanel which we'll get to uh those have been highlights for me i love their i love uh their discussions down there it, it's awful but the way she is uh she is getting inside of his head and he's the first pov character so of course we're going to keep an eye on him uh very very excited until anyway we get this we get this flashpoint of revolution until there's one lie uh a final lie is voiced the one that can only be answered by rage by cold murder and on that day blood shall rain down every wall of this vaunted weaning society and i'm just thinking is tanel gonna have this kind of change of degrees i mean he's done some awful stuff but obviously we've also seen Carsa do some awful stuff and and uh when we were in the whole when i was in house of chains i did this video about about when when do we really uh, uh when when with some of these people who do reprehensible things is change for the good uh something that we just cannot celebrate because all obviously carsa is someone who did awful things but he was really tied to he was kind of a creation of his of his uh, upbringing and, and you know look at the people around him uh and and look where he is sort of becoming i, I mean obviously obviously he's still sort of a maniac but we kind of we kind of celebrate carsa because we like where some of the direction of of that is is coming i i think of uh Ikarium, who who is this half jagged half something else which i can't remember but he would have those two sides working anyway i'm not going to even get to this flipping chapter unless i start okay we start with these turtles this analogy of the turtles which i to i don't totally get yet uh but it's these vinic turtles where the females dwell in this river and I'm going to get this all wrong. So I'm sorry. But the main part is, is once they reach this older age, their spawn or, or whatever, they, they come back and they return to where they were, where they were born or something like that. And, and uh, anyway, that's not going to be the big point of, of this video, but it's very, very interesting. We have behind the old palace, we have a hooded figure, which is Hanan mosag and he is on his way searching through these different uh barrows and nests and things but they are all empty and it, it makes mention that the searcher's blood was rotted with chaos we you know we know that's we know that uh he he is already kind of a part of the house of chains empty but not this one. But this one was not. The Azath was now nothing more than lifeless stone. Yet some sorcery lingered, curled for certain. Binding rituals, a thick interwoven skein to keep something, someone down, which I think now must be this 
Sheltantha Lore, one of these sisters who's after Menendor. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's, let's keep going, because this, uh, this eventually kind of develops. Now, we get to this crazy lady. This immortal lady, which I think is this other sister, who is also trying to free... Uh, free Sheltantha so that they, they can both go towards Menendor. And she's eating people. She's eating leathery rapists and stuff. I mean, at least she's targeting... Uh, anyway, I guess it's not good to eat anyone. So I shouldn't say anything that I'm going to have to drag out the podium again. Okay. Uh, she led him into the alley. And then she drove one hand into this rapist's heart tearing out his heart remember and this this points back to the prologue in a couple areas it points back most obviously with the people who were uh at the end of the prologue the the gray swords i i thought were there but you know i'd have to go back but their heart has been ripped out and it also goes back to uh, kind of this imagery where Gothos went to this, no, where Kilmandaros went to this area, and it's almost like the ground had been torn away, and, and it kind of reminds you of the same sort of thing. So she's going around doing that, and uh, doesn't want to be caught, necessarily, because the errant's probably around, the Elder God male is kicking around, and we don't know who else is maybe kicking around in this in this place that maybe we maybe I don't know about yet I, I'm assuming maybe male isn't the only one who knows okay we go to Rautos who I am super intrigued by both himself and this thing you know he's supposed to be working on some other things but he is so engrossed in these things that are buried beneath his his palace here and he is lost in thought there's these mystery mysterious objects deeply buried and disconnected and he sends his assistant venet off uh, on these other tasks and tells him to be careful to go over to where this factor is this letter annect he's the factor right the one who stole red masks or kind of a, a, a kidnapped Red Mask's sister. And then when when uh, they were bargaining, she killed herself and he's been, you know, he still felt entitled to those lands and was taking the taking the livelihood, the, the flocks. Uh, yeah, and, and this Rautos guy, who's a Lethary, uh, figures that this... Uh, this factor has indeed sort of lost his restraint and, and is lost his mind a little bit. No longer harnessed to reason for that, uh, for that matter, uh, or for that matter, common sense. Okay. So, err on the side of caution. And just at that moment, unseen behind them on the river, again, going back to these turtles, a massive shape, assuming one of these massive male turtles, beneath one venic nest and just swallows the whole nest entire. Oh man. Oh man. Uh, when I when I think of these turtles, I think of the that what was that one? The scorpion kind of fight? Unho uh, what was it called? Not Unholy Union, but Joyful Union. Uh, and I'm wondering more what we're going to get with these turtles. It's very cool. Okay, next scene. We have Tayhole and Bug. And he says in this first line, Witnessing something is one thing. Understanding it is another. In his normal eye, he witnesses... In his blue eye, he understands. It's almost like this eyes to see sort of uh, thing where uh, think of the Sita as well. 
he had these glasses, but it wasn't really the the eyes, his physical eyes, that he really saw what was going on. It was it was his understanding, which I love. I love, love, love that idea in all sorts of books. And so, well, not all, all sorts of books, but I love that idea. It's kind of this difference between uh, knowledge and perhaps wisdom. You could know a million things, but wisdom is something that uh, is not necessarily, in my in my view, gathered by an accumulation of of knowledge necessarily. I mean, that's that's overly simplifying things because obviously it sure helps to to make uh, you know to to think things through. You want to have the information. But wisdom comes from really having a, a different sort of perception and way to think through things and and not always be so certain on your one sides like this Karos guy was trying to teach this Tano guy. And uh, questioning things, being able to think through things and wanting to know more and and seeing something and wondering if that's uh, to be taken at face value or if it's almost all the way there, if there's just a little more, if maybe the person who you're talking with is close but maybe maybe is not really getting it completely themselves. Anyway, anyway, this is... I, I don't want to make sure this uh, goes forever, but it's very interesting that Tehole, along with a lot of these... Uh, he goes along with the theme of these two of these two things within people. Now we have this very confusing paragraph that I'm not going to read it all. Uh, on the bottom of 179. That I have to go back and read. Actually, I'll, I'll re I will read part of this. The errant follows the warlock king. To see what the uh, to see what he plans, the warlock king meddles with nefarious rituals set in place by another ascendant, who in turn leaves off eating a freshly killed corpse and makes for an unexpected rendezvous with said warlock king, where they will probably make each other's acquaintance, then bargain to mutual benefit over the crumbling chains chains binding another ascendant. Okay, well, this actually makes a lot more sense after getting through this chapter. Uh, one soon to be freed, which will perturb someone far to the north. Although, that one is probably yet ready to act. In the meantime, the long-departed Edur fleet skirts the Draconian Sea and shall soon enter the river mouth on its fated return to the, our fair city. And with it are two fell champions. Hmm. Neither of whom is likely to do what is expected of them. Uh, is this like Ikarium and, and Karsa? Now, to add spice to all that, the secret that is the soul of one Scabandari blood eye will in a depressingly short time cease to be a secret. And consequently, and in addition to, uh, oh, the concomitant with, uh, and con man, that's a weird word, I've never heard that. We are in for an interesting summer. I just love everything that is being built up with this. Okay, let's get through it without uh, slowing down too much. But we now also mention uh you know they they talk about very briefly this you know he, they didn't bug didn't even mention this grand scheme to bankrupt the empire and now we know that the you know we know the invigilator is off karos is off to get uh off to get tayhole and it's so cool because in the very let's see if i can just skip here <laughs> I'll just mention this before going to the next thing. Uh, we, there, yeah, he, he closes his brown eye, opening his blue eye. 
at the very end here, which kind of implies that he's still kind of in control, I think, of, you know, he understands what is happening more than just witnessing something. He's an active participant and and he is kind of in control, I, I think. Anyway, the very next thing, we have Tanel bringing a wooden box. And as soon as you see that, you think, okay, this, this has got to be Bugs, the box that Tail wanted Bug to make. And inside, there are these, these tiles, and there is this two-headed bug. Which, again, is such a cool way of an, another representation of this theme. And so we know that he, this Tayhole is the one who's sending these puzzles out to, out to Karos. And the whole purpose of it, can't touch the bug, you can't, uh, yeah, it just walks in a circle. You can change the tiles and things, but the whole idea is to make it stop uh, before it dies, which will be in about four months. You, no object can be placed in the container, but the sequence needs to be found. You can't physically touch the insect either. Which is so cool. I, I can't wait to see where this goes. Uh, they, they mentioned that there's this contagion down below and three people have died. And immediately, you know, we had the contagion and the, the disease from the last book and it might just be meaning that but it also probably means uh, a contagion you know implies maybe a contagion kind of like this this uh janeth this lady is uh, kind of of words of different ideas going into people obviously that's going to be going into tanel's mind all right so let's keep going here i love this next scene Okay, 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 okay. Uh, he's considering here. No, no, no. This is this is her considering, I believe. Eh, it doesn't really matter. We get the information that probably here, uh, where they are at, is not human design, nor jagged, nor even tarthanol. What are the details of this unknown com uh, complex? In short, later on down here, after this big long thing, which I'm not going to go over. Lethras, the colony of the First Empire, was founded upon the ruins of an earlier city. One whose layout seemed to disregard the presence of the Jagged Towers and the Azath, suggesting that it predates both. Ooh, just so cool. Even the first engineer, uh, Sidin Khan, was an unable or unwilling to attempt an identification of these early builders. Holy smokes, it's just so cool. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. And this is a very neat part. Khan's analysis of these efforts led him to conclude that a catastrophic climate change had occurred. Again, you think of Gothos and what he did and the ice fields, and that would have been very quick, probably. Uh, I'm guessing it's that. And the efforts indicated a desperate attempt to add insulation. Presumably, that effort failed. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So she's this, this Janath person. I hope things work out for her. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm not holding out hope. But I am hoping that her words to Tanel will not go on. You know, it, it will mean something. I... I hope, and not just for the reader to gather things. I hope it, I hope it means something for this Tanel guy, and maybe uh, has some sort of real effect in in this story because she's super interesting. But I am predicting some sort of suicide or something, or it will just be too late for this guy. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, he comes down to talk to her again. And he wants, she wants him to take the flame away. And he says, well, you'll just go blind if you don't have it. And again, think of this thing with the eyes and witnessing versus really knowing or understanding. She doesn't need her eyes down here to, to think through things. 
she has her understanding is the way I, I view this. Okay. And this is an, an interesting part as well, as they're talking. Panic cares for nothing, for what can and can't be done, Tano. One day you will discover that. There was a priest once in the second century who created a cult founded on the premise that every victim tallied in one's mortal life awaits that one beyond death. We're familiar with that. From the slightest of wounds to this most grievous, uh, to the most grievous, every victim preceding you into death waits for you. So this idea that uh, if you wrong somebody, they will be waiting to kind of get their recompense or to, you know, you'll get what's coming to you at the hands of them. A mortal, conducts, uh, a mortal conducts spiritual economics in his or her life, amassing credit and debt. Tell me, patriotist, how indebted are you by now? How vast the imbalance between good and a good deeds and your endless acts of malice. And he puts us off a bizarre and insane cult. No wonder it failed. In this empire, empire, in this empire, yes, it's no wonder at all. The priest was set upon the streets and torn limb from limb. And that kind of reminds me of the people of Drek on uh, Cartool Island in this last book a little bit. Still, it said, adherents remain among the defeated peoples, the Tarthanol, the Fent, and the Narek, the victims, as it were, of lethary cruelty. Hmm. And you wonder, you wonder if, you know, you wonder about when you see some of these cults and, and religions in this series, you wonder about what is really the intent of what it was when it was first created or you know there there might not really be a creation for these because they always come from something some idea before it and you wonder about some of the intent for some of these and how it has kind of been changed by changed by degrees and I've, that could happen with anything that could happen with any of these concepts in this series you know if you do the extreme example, I mean, I guess you could say that the idea of the crippled God is not truly understood yet. Uh, but that, you know, I don't want to go there because I, he's, he's our villain as far as I can tell. And, but you see things like hood and now hood is really specifically kind of, uh, named as the reaper and, wondering what we're going to understand or get revealed to us more about hood because i everyone seems to be so afraid of hood and in what was it in the third book where he offered his services uh for a while and i i like hood for some reason i get so intrigued by by that guy and and what we're going to find out more hopefully about that and and probably about his realm specifically on top of many others but that's my guess as well okay let's keep going don't mean to yell in the microphone either okay here's an interesting note At, right after saying well obviously they fail and and later on we will see this again where when things kind of co-mingle these two kind of ideas or peoples it will sort of resonate and, and go for a while. It'll survive for a while. Uh, sometimes it'll quickly fall away. Sometimes it'll take a little bit longer. And no wonder that this, this cult did not last, I guess, very long within the Lethry sort of foundation, if that makes sense. But it maybe would thrive somewhere else and is maybe flourishing, coming back. Okay. Uh... Tanel uh, Yathvanar sneered. The ones who fail ever need a crutch, a, a justification. They fashion virtue out of misery. That reminds me also of what's going on with the crippled god. 
it's almost like they are seeing their pain and creating it into some sort of holy virtue. And even if people are under different, uh, even if people are worshiping different ascendants or whatever, that basic foundational idea of, of turning misery into a, into a virtue might kind of be something that spreads to all of them. And indeed, the house of chains would be, would be vast, in my opinion. Okay, we're not very far through this. But she's getting in his head. What did I write here? Okay. Carol's invicted. Do you know why he so despises academics? He is a failed one himself. And this also makes me kind of think this has got to be a part of the reason probably why Tehol is, is messing with him a little bit. Maybe. But he was always driven by emotions, rife with anger. Think of this hot iron thing from House of Chains. But years later, he learned that all emotion had to be scoured from him. Only then would his inner vision become clear again. His inner vision. This, uh, yeah, very, very cool. Delicious irony. Karos Invicted became a victim himself. Getting ensnared in that. Uh, if I'm on the right track with that, at least. Okay. The world hurt him. So now he's hurting it back, and yet he has still to even the score. And he has found this virtue like others in, in misery. So even though Karos uh, really kind of schooled uh, Tanel when they were talking about this certainty and, and uncertainty, it's like this Janeth as well as Tehol are kind of schooling Karos. Very, very cool. That's the way I see that, at least. But I'm willing to willing to change my mind on that if, if people have a different idea. No wonder he bridles his self-righteousness for all his claims to emotionless intellect. I love these scenes between these two. Uh, okay. Tannel hissed, rail at me all you will, scholar. I expect that. But not at Karos Invicted. Yeah, he like smacked her. He is the Empire's last true hope. And remember, he's trying to hold on to this other way of doing things. Tanel has this way of, this better way of doing things, and Tehol's trying to bankrupt that. Anyway, I might be looking too much into some of this stuff. So take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Karos Invicted will guide us into glory, into a new age of, uh, a new age, an age without Edur, without the mixed bloods, without even the failed peoples. So not struggling with those two dimensions, but this trying to seek an age without duality, an age where this is the one way we do things. This is our the one culture, the one race. Uh, yeah, without that balance. No, just the lethery, an empire expanding outwards with, with sword and fire, all the way back to the homeland of the first empire. He has seen our future, our destiny. She stared at him, putting uncertainty into Tano. Karos invicted the great scholar in his empire of thugs. He struck her again hard. She was practically unconscious. On the other side, I will wait for you. On the other side, she says. Tanel felt a slither deep in his gut and fled from it. No god waits to pass judgment, he's saying in his, in his head. No one marks the imbalance of deeds. No god is beyond its own imbalances. For its own deeds are as subject to judgment as any other. So who then fashions this after 
this afterlife, some natural imposition. Uh, and and you can see where why he would why he would think something like that like no god can pass judgment because who passes judgment on them tanel found himself walking up the corridor he had no recollect, uh, recollection of actually leaving which kind of implies to me that she is in his head even though she's chained down there uh, she is up here as he leaves the dungeon. Karos has said again and again, justice is a conceit. It does not exist in nature. Retribution seen in natural catastrophes is manufactured by all too eager and all too pious people. Each one convinced the world will end but spare them and them alone. But we all know the world is inherited by the obnoxious, not the unrighteous. Unless came the voice of Janeth in his head. The two are one in the same. She's, she's in there. And listen to this last part of this scene as he's going up by himself. He snarled as he hurried up the worn stone stairs. She was far below, chained. A prisoner in her solitary cell. There was no escape for her. I have left her down there far below, far behind. She can't escape. Yet in his mind, he heard her laughter and was no longer so sure. It's just amazing. I love this. Now, this could be something, uh, you know, I love the fantasy and the high fantasy in this, even though it's not really something I'm very familiar with. So when we have some of these scenes that don't have that kind of element. That is just what I'm so into. Uh, one of my favorite books is The Count of Monte Cristo. And the thing I hate about the movie uh, uh, that is not in the book is the movie kind of has to go through a lot. And uh, the the book really has a lot of this these amazing scenes being set up. And... It takes a long time to progress. But in the movie, you got to get through it in a couple hours. So they take like 800 pages and turn this great story into a swashbuckler. And the revenge doesn't hit the same way uh, as it does in the book. And I love that they are doing that sort of thing here. Yes, there's violence and all sorts of things so far. But there is a lot to consider in these interactions between these different people and i just love it so far i think it's so great so great really a high point in the series this this sub book one of reaper's gale i i love it okay now this is a confusing scene a little bit with the errant and menendor and i'll try to rip through it a little bit but uh, Menendor is trying to find where Gothos now is, probably long dead. Uh, she had read a lot of his writing, I believe, but it doesn't really end. There's no conclusion, which does that mean he's trapped? Does that mean he's uh, committed suicide? She doesn't know what's going on. He thought he could hear Gothos laughing somewhere. This is the errant, sorry. Same as, remember, in the scene before it, we have Janeth in Tanel's head. But the errant, who's supposed to be this guy who sees everything, now only saw those blank tiles a couple chapters ago. Doesn't really see what the errant, or, or what uh, this last Sita saw and some of these other ones. It's just amazing. Okay. Well... He said with a soft sigh, to bring a journey to this close, one must first begin it. Best I act whilst the will remains. The next step shook him in, took him into a glade. Such verdant grasses underfoot, da, da 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 And a voice spoke behind him. I do not welcome company here. This is Manindor. And it just gets amazing. Uh, and he, is this... Let me, let me just, uh, 
they want to make this temporary, well, he wants to make this sort of temporary alliance sort of thing, just the way Hannon will do it later and just the way we will also have with this other thing. But I, I kind of have forgotten this scene a little bit, so let me just... Uh, who but you could have guessed that I require justification for killing? Right, he's like, are you wanting to kill me? I don't need any justification for that. Or, or, or who but you could have guessed that I require just sorry. Uh, so your sense of sarcasm has survived your solitude, Menendor. Like, what do you want with me? I have information to impart. This is the errant. Which you will find well suited to your nature. And I seek recompense. They talk about the sky keeps. Oh, I see. Has it begun then? No, but soon. And which side will we eventually find you on, Menendor? Mine, of course. What warren are we in? You would not believe me if I told you. That one. So I don't know. I don't know what warren this is. And it's just dying. It's just killing me. Very well, your sisters will conspire. Not against me, Errant. Has she been freed then? I, I think this is the Sheltantha lore. It's imminent. What of the others in that fell city? Others? Male is being male. Who else hides in Letharis barring your two sisters? Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. I, I, I'm a little bit shaky on, on this scene because I, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time with this quite yet, but he leaves. He leaves. And is back in the Eternal Domicile's fifth wing. But he has information. Okay. And then who shows up? But Shadow Throne and Hood. So now the three of them. Manandor, Shadow Throne, Hood. Just such a cool scene. Uh, the god known as Shadow Throne tilted his head towards the tall, cowled figure opposite. Humblest apologies, Reaper. So now we get them. The title, Reaper. We three fell creatures have met, have spoken, have agreed on scant little. You know, these three people uh, don't really have... They may have... You know, they, they don't agree on things. This is kind of like... The E-Doer and the Andy, how they just don't mix, but temporarily they had this joined uh, common cause. And that's part of what is going on here. Even though it's not to help each other, it's just that by doing that, they will all get, uh, they will all win something that they want from this. Nonetheless, it seems we are agreed more or less on the one matter you, Hood, wanted to address. It's no wonder you're so ecstatic. Manandor frowned uh, at the dark lord, the lord of death. Know that I have never accepted your claim. I'm crushed, so your sisters are after you. What a dreadful family you have. Do you want help? You too? Recall, uh, recall my dismissal of the errant. Uh, remember, yeah, he did that. Uh, Shadowthrone sh shrugged. Elders think too slowly. My offer is of one uh, is of another magnitude. Think carefully before you reject it. And what do you ask in return, Menendor asks Shadow Throne. The use of a gate. The gate he wants to use is Starval Demolane. This is the, this dragon's. To what end? Why, providing you with assistance, of course. You want my sisters out of the way, too. Perhaps more than I do. Squirming on that throne of yours, are you? It's a convenient convergence of desires, Manandor. If I give you access to Starval Demolane, you will use it more than once. I love this idea of temporary alliance. Not I. Do you so vow? Why not? Foolish. Hood said in a rasp. I hold you to that vow, Shadow Throne. Then you accept my help? convergence of desires as you said you're right shadow throne said 
I retract all notions of help. We are mutually assisting one another. As Fitz said, convergence. This is very interesting here. You too, Hood said, turning away, are worse than advocates. And you don't want to know what I do with the souls of advocates. A heartbeat later, he vanished. Shadow Throne, what are advocates? A profession devoted to the subversion of laws for profit. So think of what, think of all the lethry in, uh, in Hood's realm. Or on their way to Hood's realm, I guess. And what is he doing with them? He hates, he hates advocates. When I was emperor, I considered butchering all advocates. So why didn't you? She asked. The royal advocate said it'd be a terrible mistake. Of course he did. Okay, which is hilarious. Okay, now we get to one more time we get this Janel, who is this mangled up queen. And I think I can go through this because we're, we're you know, we're running kind of long on time. But she is speaking with this Nissal, who's the first concubine, who really is one of the only people who can get close to Emperor Rulad. And Janel is has been promised to be the queen of the house of chains so does that mean he will she will be uh calor's you know spouse or, or whatever kind of the 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 partners with calor or a queen within the house of chains while he's over being a king in some other area who who knows but i am waiting to see what the heck is up with calor where the heck is that guy i thought he was going to be more central. But I mean, he might be central in these last books. I hope so. I hope so. Okay. And she does not trust. She does not trust this Nissal, even though Nissal says that she's still wanting, you know, still trying to serve. Okay. Uh, I am queen. That pup on the throne, meaning Rulad, uh, will come, will come here for me, his queen. You blind Rulad to the truth, but his vision will clear once we are rid of you. Again, we're talking about vision. So cool. I came, Nissal said, to see if you needed anything. Liar. You came to search for allies. You think to steal him away from me and from our true master. Cripple God, right? You will fail. Where's my son? Where is he? I don't even know if he's alive. But Empress, I will seek to find out and I will return. I don't believe you. This is an amazing page here. This page uh, 194. Uh, yeah, I don't believe you. You were Eskar's whore, not mine. Has Turidal Brizad visited you, Empress? And this is this person who was kind of an advisor for the Queen before, I think in midnight tides i'd have to go back he doesn't dare master sees through my eyes again the eyes so now it's like they can detect really uh that somebody has changed or somebody working behind those eyes which I i've all i just love that concept uh look closer if you would know a god the god the only god that matters now the rest of them are blind as blind as you've made Rulad, but they're all in for surprise. Oh yes, the house is big, bigger than you can imagine. The house is all of us. And one day the truth will be proclaimed so that all will hear. See me? I'm on my knees and that is no accident. Every human shall be on their knees one day and they shall know me for their queen. As for the king in chains, well, the crown is indifferent to whose skull it binds. It's just amazing. And I still don't really understand it because if Rulad is this, is this uh, emperor and he's kind of acting as a king, doesn't that make Kalor not, you know, the Kalor is supposed to be the king. Anyway, maybe she just doesn't understand all of what's going on or who knows. The pup is failing, you know, failing there's dissatisfaction again think of 
think of this idea of that was in the epigraph of this where it's just slowly kind of sinking away until there's this flashpoint maybe. And I get the idea that Rulad is maybe trying to resist uh, this this other nature and, and maybe we're not done with Rulad having some sort of good moment, but this could just be a, a tragedy by the end. I don't know. I, I hope for the best with, with Rulad. I should kill you now here. Empress, the Chancellor is the source of Rulad's failings. Your god should know that, lest it make a mistake. If he should kill anyone, it should be tribe and Knoll. It's this person who's filtering information going to Rulad. Or perhaps, or and perhaps, Kairos Invicted. They plot to usurp the Edur. The Edur? Spat the queen. Master's almost done with them. Almost done. Like, that's, we're not worried about that. I will send servants down. And, you know, Janel doesn't want anything like that to happen. Doesn't trust anyone, she says, but, and doesn't want people to see her this way. But she says, you know, we can, we can cover you up and you can send these nasty sheets and things like it stinks in her room. This queen who's going to be in charge of everything, she is just living in wretched squalor and is in a terrible shape. It's, it's awful. Okay. Now, Jano, queen of the House of Chains. Uh, yeah, she's curled on this disgusting floor. And it's so interesting. Uh, she, suffering is our natural state, a truth to proclaim. And so I shall when I win my new throne. So it's, it, again, it's this thing where this House of Chains encompasses all. And it is the suffering uh, that that really, may, maybe I'm getting it wrong, but it's like the suffering meets everyone. But what you do with that suffering maybe is really when you fall into this House of Chains thing. I, I, I'm not totally sure. But it sounds like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into that a ton here because it's, it's getting late. Okay. And she's talking with the crippled god in her head or, or whatever. Uh, and she wants the throne as he promised. Is it worth it? I beg you. And this is the crippled god also talking back to her, I, I guess, or the herald or something. Uh, they, no, it would be the crippled god. They all beg me and call it prayer. I must find the broken ones. Just do not expect my reach, my touch. No one understands how the gods fear freedom. No one. You've lied to me. You've lied to yourself. You all do and call it faith. I am your God. I am what you made me. You all decry my indifference, but I assure you, you would greater decry my attention. And like that, I'm just waiting to see where this flipping goes in the series. I want my throne. He's basically saying, are you sure? I will answer your prayers, I promise. Just do not ever say I didn't warn you. Do not ever. Janna laughed, spraying spit. We are mad. Oh yes, quite mad. And we're climbing into the light. And I had to stop with that last, we're climbing into the light and I, I didn't understand and I still don't really, but it's very, very cool. Okay, let's go on here. We have Nissel. And we have this, is this, oh, right. Uh, she runs into this guy, this Bruthen, who wants to talk with Rulad. He wants to get a private audience with Rulad, but he's not given that audience. There's all these people uh, coming to, to Rulad, but they're all lethary, and it's these, leth uh, these lethary issues that he has to deal with and he's trying his best to do that but he's not getting the full report from the Edur and the Edur are extremely spread out and this is seems like by design and Tanel kind of seems like this puppet master handler of of Rulad 
So it's even though they've conquered, it sure doesn't seem like it, especially with the Edur really spread out and and it makes a special note that Rulad is is an Edur totally on his own. And remember this this uh theme of sundering, of tearing away, especially when it comes to shadow, and Edur kind of represent this, uh, and he is on his own. So we will see what he chooses to do. Sounds like shadow could go either way. A little bit more light or a little bit more dark. Okay. And he is offering uh, assistance. He wants to warn her that, uh, warn Nissal that they're trying to kind of arrest her for sedition. Karos and Vikdad is doing that, so he's not there to do that, but is is uh, wanting to warn her again. Uh, and he wants a special audience with Rulad, which would be probably extremely dangerous for her to set up but uh, they know that the only reports the emperor receives regarding the patriotists are those from the invigilator himself and uh, anyway I, I think we can skip through some of that some of this stuff because we've already mentioned this uh yeah here the only edur truly alone here is the emperor and perhaps hanan Mosak. And there's this interesting line here. Perhaps then, first concubine, we can work together to help him realize his vision. Remember, he's even though he's this Edur uh, emperor, he's not getting his his way with things. He, and he offers he offers two kind of guards, these security. Your bodyguards had best be subtle, Bruthen. The Chancellor's spies watched me constantly. The Edur smiled. Uh, Nissal, we are children of shadow. I love that. Very, very cool. All right, are we almost done? Looks like we have uh, a couple more pages. We can zip through this, I think. Okay. Once long ago, she had walked for a time through Hood's realm. In the language of the Elaint, the warren that was neither new nor elder was known to uh, as Festerithan, the layers of the dead. So we're talking about Hood's realm. And the more I think about this, you know, everyone's scared of Hood's realm, but I wonder what we're supposed to understand. Or, you know, what, what are we supposed to hope for? Because obviously Hood does not have a claim now that Gothos did his thing, people don't really die. Man, I'm reading that wrong. But it's very interesting to see what's going to happen. Every species that ever existed was trapped in the sediments of this realm. Not in the same manner and of similar formations of geology as could be found in any world. No, in Hood's realm, the soul sparks persisted. Their lives abandoned here, crushed into immobility. The stone itself was in a particular oxymoron that plagued the language of death alive. Isn't that cool? In the broken grounds surrounding the lifeless Azath, long extinct creatures had crawled back through the gate. Think of the turtles, rents, fissures, as if a terrible demon had slashed from both both sides again think of that from the from the prologue there have been battles here and spilling of ascendant blood this part is very cool she had long since discovered a host of truths in time's irresistible progression raw became refined and with refinement power grew even deadlier so these two Think of raw Edur, raw lethery, refined, deadlier power. All that was simple. All that was simple would, in time and under sufficient pressure, and if random chance proved benign rather than malignant, acquire greater complexity, as it's 
refined. But this complexity crumbled into dissolution. Some forms rose and fell extremely quickly, while others could persist for extraordinarily long periods in seeming stasis. And I, of course, I think of the Roman Empire, who seemed to be this greatest, uh, this greatest version, other than, you know, the, the, the United States, again, is, is this sort of thing, but this version of gathering all these elements of all these different cultures and ways of doing things. You know, the, the Romans fought with the Spanish sword and they, they did, they, they borrowed some elements of navigating from the Carthaginians. You know, they didn't want to do things like Egypt in, in a lot of ways because Egypt was a little bit weird, but they sure borrowed, they, they worked with Egypt. They had all these different ways of doing things and people could worship their own gods as long as they also worship the Roman gods. But it's this great combining and eventually, it, you know, it, it kind of shook out of control and it, and it split, it split and you, and it seemed like an impossibility that such a thing would happen. And, uh, you know, it's not to predict anything with the United States, but obviously we've seen a lot of, again, it's, it's built upon this idea of, of kind of bringing in the best of, of many different many things that many different countries and cultures uh, can bring. It seems like it's that. Uh, but this raw becomes refined and then it's, you know, it's uh, truth is lost a little bit. If, if you kind of mix those two things from the epigraph with this uh, until it maybe lasts for a little while or it lasts for a long time until it gets to this flashpoint revolution. And yeah. Very, very interesting. And we are seeing that play out with this kingdom, which again, as someone who loves history and loves, uh, you know, it's not just Rome, it's all these different places and seeing what made them so uh, prominent, but what were some of the things that was like a flashpoint that caused things to rupture. And when it does rupture, it ruptures into many, many pieces and it's like it's just vacuumed up or new sorts of kingdoms are, are created in its wake. Okay. Very, very cool, I think, and I keep saying that. Thus she believes she comprehended more than most. This is this uh, Nissal person, right? Or, or am I? No, 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 no. This is not. This is this person who's eating, who's eating people. This sister. She could see through the chaos in him. She's seeing this malformed shape, which is Hanan Mosak. She could see the chaos in him. He had grown aware of her presence and fear whispered through him, the sorcery of the crippled God building. Yet he was uncertain if she presented a threat. I am Hanan Mosak. You are, the figure said without turning, you are the soul taken, the cruelest of the sisters, accursed among the Edu or Pantheon, your heart is betrayal. Okay. Heart, heart. It's, it, it's done on purpose. I greet you, Sukal uh, Ankadu, sister to Menendor and Lore, right? Betrayal belongs to the one buried beneath, she says to him. This is this Sheltantha Lore, I believe. To the sister you once worshipped, any betrayals plaguing your people of late? You work to free her, he mentions. I always worked better with Sheltantha lore than I did with Menendor. And again, uh, it's like, even though they don't want to help each other, they have this joined uh, thing that could help both of them. It may be, Hannah Mosek said, that we could work together for a time. Silch's ruin hunts for the one scavendari blood eye, I believe, uh, that I thought was here. I doubt that either of you or Sheltanthalor would be pleased if he was to succeed. If Silch's ruin would find scavendari blood eye. I can guide you onto his trail. I can lead you support at the moment of confrontation. This is going to be so cool. And in return, 
In return, we can see an end to your killings and eating of the citizens in the city. For another, we can destroy Silchus' ruin. I've heard that determination voice before, Hannah Mosag. Is the crippled god truly prepared to challenge him? Is he prepared to challenge Silchus' ruin? With allies, yes. Does Silchus' ruin travel alone? No. Uh, Hannah Mosag said, Atist Edur, the eldest brother of the Sengars, once commander of the Edur warriors. A surprising alliance. Again, this is another one of those things. The two raw materials uh, refined in this company. A surprising alliance. And eventually, it, it you know, same kind of alliance that we got with, with uh, Kaladin Brood and Dujek One Arm. We've seen this concept from Memories of Ice. Probably from before it, but I'm just an idiot and didn't see it. He too seeks the finest uh, and will, I believe, do all he can to prevent its falling into Ruin's hands. Ah. Experience, expedience plagues us all. She mentions, we are agreed. But tell your crippled god this. And this is a warning. Fleeing at the moment of attack, abandoning Shaltantha lore and myself to Silchus Ruin and say, making off with the finest during the fight will prove a fatal error. With our dying breaths, we will tell Silchus Ruin all he needs to know, and he will come after the crippled god, and he will not relent. Oof. You will not be abandoned, he says again. As for the Finnis itself, do you wish to claim it for yourself? It's interesting how, again, this is uh same sort of thing. You know, it's the same Finnis, right, that was claimed by Gothos in the prologue. We'd, we'd rather see it destroyed. I see. Would you object then to the crippled gods making use of its power? Will such, uh, will such use achieve eventual destruction? Oh, yes, Suko. Uh, Ankadu. She shrugged. As you like. Your god matches, marches to war. He will need help. Uh, she will need all the help he can get. And Hannah Mosag replies, he is incapable of marching. He does not even crawl. The war comes to him, sister. And you see this so much. You see this even though the threat is of evil kind of spreading like a plague everywhere. The war uh, comes often to, to, uh, to the evil one, the one who is kind of this embodiment of, you know, they they spread chaos, but to go defeat chaos, you got to go and cut off the head of, of the one kind of causing it. Anyway, uh, I, I thought that was kind of interesting. If there was uh, if there was any hidden significance to that distinction, Suko Anadu was unable to discern it. Discern it. Her gaze lifted, and she sees. Uh, Again, we get back to these turtles, I believe. Wheeling gulls, strange islands of sticks and grasses, so the water's kind of lifting up. Uh, and she could sense beneath the swirling surface enormous belligerent leviathans. You know how much I'm obsessed with that term because it kind of implies this, uh, this not only that it's a beast, but it's like this ultimate, ultimate kind of beast. Uh, using the islands as bait. She's coming, Hannah and Mosag. She'll tap the Lord's coming. Shall I leave? Or will she be amenable to our arrangement? Cannot speak for her. Best you depart. She will, after all, be very hungry. Besides, she and I have much to discuss. All wounds to mend. Old wounds to mend between us. She watched as the malformed warlock dragged himself away. After all, you are much older, uh, you are much more her child than you are mine. And I'd rather, again, and we also go back to, uh, this is going to be, man, this is going to be long. I, I must be over an hour already. Uh, but again, it's these dual natures of, of, uh, 
you know, everyone. We all have many, many people in our family history, and we have a lot of their same sorts of. Uh, uh, there, we have some a lot of their similar traits. You know, I'm very much like my mom and my dad in a lot of ways, but in some ways, I have chosen against some of that nature to become, you know, who I am. And I love that that balance here. And that's just one more thing that he kind of sends her off. It kind of leaves that in our, as something to think about, uh, as the last lines of this amazing, amazing chapter. And now chapter six, I assume by the look of where we get to sub book two, you know, it's only 30 pages away, 32 pages. I'm assuming that this will be the last chapter in sub book two. And we will see what happens in the next one. But this has just been, uh, I, I've just been on fire for this Reaper's Gale so far. Not every chapter is going to be this way. Because I will burn out. And I'm sure you guys don't want to hear it. And a lot of it is kind of thinking on my feet. But uh, I'm really loving it. And, and if you have made it this far, thank you. Uh, I'm just fascinated by what's going on, and I will try to make these a little bit shorter in the future. Bye.